having me and um, yeah, I'm like ready to talk cosplay and you know, show you guys uh, some of the behind the scenes stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So you've been in the industry for a while now. Um, how does I think it's really fun? funny because cosplay has <laughs> only recently become an industry. Yeah. So, so it is weird to describe it with that term. Yeah, it's, it's a bit weird, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But you've become a cosplayer, been a cosplayer for quite a while now. So yes. how does AFCON compare to other cons you've been to? Are you enjoying it? I am enjoying it immensely. Uh, I personally uh, really enjoy cons that are made for fans, by fans, and I think that feel of uh, close-knitness is very apparent here. Um, and just from the email correspondences and from the Facebook page and uh, the website, I can tell that this really is a, uh, it's a, it, it is a passion uh, driven convention. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I have seen already some lovely cosplayers and uh, just, it's great for me to learn more about the cosplay scene here in Australia because mm. it, you know, I, I am pretty far away and I think each culture handles cosplay a little bit differently. Yeah, so, so definitely. It's very cool. Yeah, very different to the ones you visited recently, I'm sure. But we are really excited to have her, aren't we, guys? <laughs> fantastic. So, <laughs> we all love her. She's fantastic. Um, so, would you like to jump in and tell us about cosplay in and out and how you got here? Well, um, the the panel I want to do today, um, is, that, is that what I'm doing? I'm yeah. sorry? Okay, yeah. good, 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 good. All right, so uh, the panel I'm doing today is going to be a breakdown of a um, costume construction because I really want, I, I think a lot of uh, people see the finished work, they see the, the costume and um, it's just like, oh, it looks so great. It, you know, and, and it's very difficult to understand the creation process behind it. And if something looks very professionally made, I think it, it's difficult to uh, sort of s see the different steps. And so I have taken very extensive photos of uh, one of my costumes as I was making it. And so I think it's the easiest way to just go through the slideshow and explain to you guys how I made this costume from scratch. So, and I hope it will be interesting and informative. <laughs> so, maybe we can start the beginning of the slideshow. Slide! <laughs> Slide! Look into each of them. There we are. chosen to show you guys is my Carmilla costume from Vampire Hunter D uh, and this was a dream costume for me to make uh, I saw the movie in year 2000 when it came out but it took me until 2009 to sort of get the courage up to to make this costume because when I you know first started cosplaying I did not possess the skills uh, to, to even figure out how to make something like it and so I think it's a um, example of how sometimes you can develop your skills and you can really have patience and enjoy the journey and uh, get to a point where all of a sudden a dream costume can become a reality and so this was a milestone costume for me uh, because I learned so much of it from it. Uh, so next slide, please. So the first thing was, of course, gathering um, uh, reference pictures. And so I took screenshots from the movie and uh, tried to study her costume from every angle. And uh, for me, it's also important to look at the history of the character, the background of the character, and uh, think about like what kind of fabrics would they have worn? You know, what, what materials would their costume have been made out of? Uh, so for Carmilla, the, uh, I think the, the main challenge was to create that silhouette, because it's a very unusual silhouette, and it has some parts on it that are very, um, uh, just, they, they don't look like they should be fabric, but they still have that very distinct um, fabric look. So that was what I spent a lot of time sort of trying to research. Next slide. 
So this is how I started, very simple with a little template of uh, the shoulder pad. Because to me it was like, if I can figure out the shoulder pads, then you know I can probably go from there. Um, next. I, so here it's just more, and forgive the mess <laughs> of my house, you will see so many like, you will see so many like messy <laughs> Uh, spots because I was building this costume for a com competition and there was only about six weeks of time so at that point you just kind of like oh, what is a house <laughs> what, what are things like no it's just a costume uh, next so those are the components uh, of the the shoulder pads, and um, this was 2009 before Warbla. <laughs> so we had Wonderflex, and so I used Wonderflex for the bottom pieces uh, to for more of a support, and the tops were just uh, three millimeter um, EVA foam, so craft foam. Next, <laughs> um, that is uh, the velvet that I <coughs> used to cover the pieces with, and it's. Madonna velvet, which is super slippery, and I chose to make the entire costume out of it, and it is a bitch to sew. <laughs> next. And uh, next. So just to show, you know, next. Sorry. <laughs> this is going to be, sorry, everybody backstage, you're going to hear that a lot. Okay. So yeah, just, just to show different steps in um, covering the, the fabrics. The, the bottom gold fabric is a... Um, it's actually like a upholstery type fabric intended for heavy drapery and I really like that it had sort of a like a subtle texture on it so a lot of times I will use fabrics that um, sort of have like either a very subtle pattern or um, or to have a texture so that it gives the costume more of a lush luxurious real feel uh, and there was a lot of hand sewing involved uh, finishing these pieces off. Next. So that's the finished double weird shoulder pad. So like, it's armor, but it's still fabrics. So it's very like haute couture vampire style. <laughs> now we have um, the sleeves. So she has giant sleeves that are attached to her train. So I studied that section a lot in the movie because she's only in the movie for maybe eight minutes. And so it was like frame by frame, like, you know, what is this? And um, the, the sleeves were made out of um, two different fabrics that I just cut strips uh, and then surged the strips together to create, you know, that. Next. And just sewing again, you can see the texture. So even though the uh, reference is, you know, very, how do you say, it's like, it's very solid colors. And uh, for me, it, uh, it's about translating a design into real life. Just kind of how, you know, um, they're doing with all the superhero movies. Like they're not wearing, you know, yellow spandex. They are wearing leather. And so it's, it's, a, it's always like a translation process. Uh, next. So this is the velvet uh, train being attached to the sleeves. And so again, it was velvet with uh, like this, this satiny polyester lining. <laughs> and it was like sewing, it was like, oh, just slippering all over the place. What did I do? Um, and it, ironing this costume takes uh, over an hour. So every time I go and you know decide I'm gonna wear it, I basically spend like one to two hours like, ironing it, and then like putting on makeup, and then putting on the costume. So irony is very important, by the way. Always iron your costumes if, if you can. Next. So more sleeves. Um, they actually were so heavy that the day after I wear Carmilla, uh, my lats are always sore. So it's like workout <laughs> every time. Next. Okay, so now we're moving on to the bodice. So the bodice is obviously interesting because it is cut out the, in the front. And so I was trying to figure out like, do I need to make a plastic shell? Do I need to create like a wire frame? And um, in the end, I decided to make the bodice uh, in the similar way as a corset, 
uh, so with uh, steel boning reinforcements. And so you can see there is like this, um, I think back in 2009, I still was too broke to use real cutil, which is what uh, the, you know, historically, or I guess it's the proper material to use as the lining for corsets that gives it that strength. So I used duck cloth, I think that was still, you know, in those days. Um, uh, that's the skirt. So the, the black piping that you see, or the black trim, uh, because her outfit had uh, this, like basically stripes all over it, I bought out the entire Greater Atlanta area of this black trim. Uh, the one chain store, Joann's, which is the biggest uh, chain fabric store in America, they carried it, and so I bought. I would go to one location, buy the entire stock they had, and realized that it was not enough, and then like go to the other one and buy all of it, and then also call to see if they could order more. I mean, it was just like, I, I don't think I kept count how many meters I used, but it was, uh, it was like, at some point it was like a, what do I do if I can't find enough, you know, crap? Because it, it was a very specific type of trim, you know, and I wanted it to all match. Um, next. So this um, is the collar, and I, again, this is before Warbler. I think now with what I know, I would have made this collar very differently. And um, in 2009, I did it the only way that I knew how to, which was with a wire frame and then with Wonderflex stretched over it. Because it's not just a stand-up collar, it is three-dimensional, um, almost like a mushroom. Like the, the shape is very weird, the way that it blooms out. So I needed it to um, flare in uh, like four different directions in order to like really sit <coughs> over my shoulders and have that look. And um, it's as you can see, it's not even, which uh, is a testament to my shoulders not being even. And so it's like, you know, it looks even on me, but like right now, it's like, nope. <laughs> so I'm like, I need to go to the chiropractor, maybe. <laughs> um, so it's uh, covered with a layer of batting to get rid of the rough texture of the Wonderflex. And then with a thick uh, bridal satin, a champagne, and then again with more of those um, black trim. Buy all of it. Next. Yes. <laughs> Very excited when I was able to, you know, try it on for the first time because just that stupid piece took uh, multiple days, you know. Okay. Next. Okay. So it has a um, velvet backing. As you can see, it's not perfect because the velvet is not stretchy. So sometimes you. Uh, in cosplay, you have to sort of make that compromise because for, for a long time, I was very unhappy with how there were those wrinkles and I was like, man, what can I do? Like, this is not perfect. They're going to judge me for it. And um, I think to, like, to really enjoy cosplay, you have to at some point just let it go. You just have to do like Elsa and let it go and be like, it's okay that it's not 100% perfect. I did my best. And, you know, people don't really have, people don't really talk to me about the wrinkles. Like, it's, that's not the thing that they see. It is the thing that you see as the most critical person making it. So um, that was a great lesson to be like, it's okay, it doesn't have to be 100%, just needs to be what, whatever you can do. Next. Okay, enough collar. Let's keep going. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so um, now what was very interesting about this project was also that there were so many different techniques involved in making it. And I like projects like that. I really like costumes where you are trying to do lots of different things. And um, a lot of people ask me, like, how are you able to make costumes so fast? It's always like, how can you make it so fast? And um, I think over the years, I've developed kind of um, a way that works for me, which is to break down the costume into many different small projects. So it's not overwhelming. So just making the collar was a project, just making you know the sleeves was a project. And the great thing is that you can jump in between them. So if you get tired of doing one thing, or something needs to dry because it has to be primed and painted, then you can still be productive. 
he can still keep going and you're not bored. Like, sometimes you're frustrated doing one thing over and over again and you just want to put it down and step away from it. And uh, for me, it's, it's hard to break out of that cycle because I don't, I don't have that much time to craft. You know, like time is always against me. So um, binge crafting is basically what I call it. <laughs> But here is uh, the necklace. She has a very weird, big, gaudy, crazy looking necklace that I decided to sculpt out of clay and then make a mold. So next. Okay, those are the buttons. I also made molds of um, a beautiful lion button that I found um, because she had a lot of different gold buttons. And this is kind of a, a little trick where if you can't find enough of one button, Thank you. Uh, you can buy one and just make a little mold of it and just uh, cast the pieces out of uh, plastic. So, and so here is the mold for the um, for the for the necklace pieces. Molding. I'm I'm actually curious if uh, it is easy to get molding materials here in Australia. Like, uh, do do people use? Mm, what was that? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Mm. Okay, yeah, so I think um, we are very lucky in America that we have Smooth On and we have uh, other uh, retailers that sell Smooth On materials and tap plastics and uh, Alumilite. So there's, there's a lot of choice for even just uh, the layman cosplayer, like somebody who's just getting into it. It is very possible to just sort of jump in the deep end and go with uh, molding and casting, which I think for a long time was considered an advanced technique, but now has really become very um, standard. You know, resin casting of gems and such is, is something that many cosplayers do, and it is just, you know, it's kind of like, that's a part of, part of it. Um, so we are very lucky that we get uh, to also um, have lots of tutorials, like the company selling the molding and casting materials will create tutorial videos and DVDs that you can purchase, and some of them will even hold classes. So hopefully with YouTube, you know, if you're interested in molding and casting, you can uh, try to find your own way to learn it. You know, I, I learn plenty from YouTube and from Googling, and it is, I think the, like it is a huge part of cosplay is the research and the learning of techniques. Um, so those are the pieces of the necklace cast in um, plastic and um, <laughs> they look very not perfect because her necklace looks weird like this weird molten gold, you know, kind of like blobs with like a poor scorpion encased in gold. <laughs> I'm like why? So continue. Um, this was the hair piece. So I was trying to figure out like how do I get this hair ring around her cones and then I decided what if I made it out of a flexible rubber so that I could actually bend it around it instead of trying to you know sculpt something that was a cone shape and would fit the hair piece perfectly. I was like let me just make something that is flexible. So this is a uh, urethane mold that um, I powdered with uh, gold powder so that when it's cast out, it already is like has gold embedded into it. Continue. So these are the beginnings of the hair cones, just very simple, um, you know, floral department uh, foam um, that I cut and like put up next to my head and be like, I hope this is the right size, <laughs> you know, continue. Uh, those are the weird gold balls that are at the end of the hair cone. So they just were the, you know, plastic balls that you can get at craft stores. But can you get these here? I'm sure, right? Like, yeah, like ornament uh, components. Um, so this became my station for at least two or three days, just that little messy corner um, where I just uh, cover the hair cones. Uh, what I did was buy two of the same wig and I cut apart one of the wigs to use the hair so that it would match and uh, so that it was just covered with hot 
like it was basically glued on piece by piece with hot glue and then sprayed down. And I, I mean, this is something that, that I think now is being done a lot. Like this is not something difficult. It is just time consuming and very messy because you just like have hair everywhere. But I think, yeah, back in like 2009, 2008, it was still like, how do you make weird hair balls? <laughs> it's like, now it's like, you can buy hair balls and like whatever color of the wig that you need. You can buy Odangos. So continue. Uh, yep, more hair cones. Okay, so I sewed the hair cones onto the second wig and I uh, used a curved needle and just kind of like, you know, uh, sewed it on. As you can see, you can see the seam very well and it doesn't look very natural. So if you go to the next picture, I used, I saved the top of the second wig and I just literally plopped it onto the first wig and kind of sewed it down and then I used it to blend the hair into the comb so that it would have a more natural, you know, look. So, I don't know, it looks like she grew hair horns or something. <laughs> so it just looks much more like this is in the process of blending things together. And I use that technique a lot for, for wigs still. I just like, I will buy multiple wigs, build the structure, and just like blend it all, you know. Um, now, Carmilla has a very sinister hairline. And again, 2009, this was before lace front wigs. <laughs> like lace front wigs could only be purchased for uh, I think like close to $1,000 for, you know, Beyonce or <laughs> like it's always, it, it was not available really to regular people. It was really just for celebrities or, you know, professional um, uh, drag queens or performers and such, or, you know, obviously for movies. And there was not really an easy way to even find out how to, how to do the lace front yourself. So I was kind of like, well, crap, I need this hairline. It just, it just did not look right without it. So my solution was to, um, uh, mix Elmer's glue, which is, I think, just like the school glue, like the very simple white school glue, mix it with water so that it becomes like this watered-down paste, and um, brush it onto hair fibers, and then wait overnight for it to dry, and then literally just cut out the, the hairline. So if you go to the next picture, you can see that um, I just used a piece of craft foam as the base and sort of fit it to my head and then just cut around it. So it's a, it's a cheap man's way to make a lace front. And I have seen cosplayers do it very, very well, much better than, than what I did here. Like they are able to create absolutely realistic looking hairlines with this method. So it is, I think, something worth exploring. You know, if you don't want to go into the trade of, or, or the craft of tying the, the lace. Um, so yeah, it was just basically slapped on again, kind of um, tacked down, and then um, blended into the, the hair. And that was like the majority of the wig. Okay, continue. Uh, so at that point, um, it was sort of like the week of the con, and um, I was doing finishing touches on the costume, and uh, the, the bodice, which I showed a picture earlier of, uh, because of the steel boning, it, it was able to maintain a shape. And so what I did was um, I sewed a fishing line, so clear fishing line, um, in the front in just like a, it's just a cross pattern. And it was subtle enough that when I had the white, you know, body makeup on, it blended in enough. And that was what I decided to do because I did not want to do a mesh panel or I did not want to have a wire, um, like I did not want to have a wire frame. So I think I've seen other people do the open bodice front um, with, you know, like Warbla, for example, or other thermoplastics and being able to cover it in, in fabrics. And um, so I think it definitely, there is a lot more options and techniques for something like that now. But this is, this is what I, you know, kind of came up with. So a lot of hand sewing at the end, um, that's always the finishing touches. And I was like, I just did not trust my machine to sew that trim on. So. 
continue. So uh, this was something that I was at that time very proud of. <laughs> you know, uh, I decided that I wanted the back to lace up like a corset, so um, that it would be able to actually, you know, create that. Like it had to have that structure, but I did not want the lace to show in the back because Carmilla in the movie there is a clear back shot and she does not have lacing. In the back, like so, because this was for a competition, I decided to be as accurate as possible. Which, if I had made this costume just for fun, I may have, you know, just done with the lace and been like, okay, you know, it's just for fun. But for competition, you 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 do like I at least wanted to go um, an extra step with the accuracies. So I created basically a, a fake panel in the back and um, the, the bodice laces together and then there's Velcro so that I can Velcro the, the velvet over it and it would be a more smooth um, back seam. So I was like all like, yes, I'm so proud that I did that. <laughs> and it worked somehow. <laughs> all right, so now um, I just have some pictures of the finished costume. Um, this was actually shot at a uh, university in Atlanta, and it was at night, and yes, we were trespassing, and we got exactly, I think, 12 photos off, and, and then the security lady came and very nicely asked us to leave. <laughs> so, but I got two shots out of this shoot. Um, I mean, three hours of makeup, you know, like traveling in a car somehow with this giant costume, and then five minutes, of shooting and they're like, all right, you gotta leave. Of course, you're just like, oh, just devastated. But I got this shot out of it and the next one, I believe, next. Yeah, so I got a nice close up. And um, sometimes that's all it takes, <laughs> you know? It's like sometimes you're lucky and you only need, you know, a couple of shots. Um, this is me with my friend, um, Anna. She was very, very, kind to let me cast her as my victim so she cosplayed charlotte for our skit and uh i you can you can see she i bought enough of the gold fabric that i sent um a few yards to her so that she could use the same gold on her costume so that we had an element that matched because we did not live close to each other she lives um you know in she lives in Washington, D.C., I live in Georgia, so there are several states between us, and we had to communicate uh, via phone and email, and it was mainly me bugging her, and she'd be like, hey, hey, what else do you need? Do you need some boning, you know? And, um, but yeah, she was absolutely lovely and played the perfect vampire victim. So this was shot in London, actually. I actually took this costume to London, it took two suitcases to transport it, and um, I was a part of a cosplay ball there, and it was just, I don't know, it was like a unique once-in-a-lifetime experience. And I really love this character because it is a total transformation, and I really like um, being able to kind of go completely off the deep end with the costume and um, really, like, try to become somebody else. I think because that's what cosplay is all about, is to not be yourself for a day. And with this costume, I was really um, able to act out and act evil. And uh, I would like go to my nail salon and be like, long red nail acrylics, please. You know, <laughs> I need it for my costume. And uh, it's just really fun um, to, to like be super evil sometimes. Um, Although, uh, one funny anecdote is we entered a, uh, co a contest called the Yume Cosplay Contest, and we, we won, thankfully, like lots and lots of uh, prep, and we were very, very excited that we won. And it's immediately after we won, um, uh, there was, I mean, this was back in 2009, so there wasn't that much media, but there was one interview request, like, you know, on, like, off stage, and this guy is, like, puts a microphone and a camera on her face, like, well, how do you feel? And the thing is, when you have vampire fangs in that are not custom fitted to you, that are just, like, the ones where, you know, you have, like, the friendly plastic, you kind of fit it to yourself, you 
we sound like an idiot. So it was like, you know, we did like this crazy skit, and I'm all like, ah, badass on stage. And then they're like, how do you feel you won? I'm like, I'm just so happy. Oh, I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just forever, like, no, there's no magic here. <laughs> but um, I don't know, it was crazy. It was like cat eyes at like weird little elf ears, the vampire fangs. Um, oh, the makeup. I'll, just a quick, you know, I use Cry, what did I use? It was Krylon? Was it Krylon or Red Eye? I think I did Krylon. Krylon cream based, um, not a clown white. So like for a vampire look, uh, if you want to look, you know, like ghostly undead, you don't actually use white. You use a, uh, either a mix of gray or you use like a, like an alabaster. So, um, I think I created like my little mix with like two or three different colors and it sponged on um, because it was easy to transport because the costume is so big already. I did not want to have to transport a airbrush uh, kit and a compressor. So obviously with airbrush you get much, much better coverage. <laughs> so um, if you have that option, go for the airbrush. But I just sponged it on and then sealed it off with a powder and a fixer sealant and it held pretty well actually and then just did the crazy makeup over it so yes that's how i made this costume <laughs> thank you for listening and you know hopefully it wasn't too boring and hopefully you learned something and i have no idea what time it is ah oh, it's quarter past so we've got about 15 oh, minutes wonderful. left okay great yeah I, so yeah if there are any questions if i was like if I went too fast at some point, or you're confused about something, or if you have a question in general, uh, feel free to ask, because I'm here to help. I'm here to assist as much as I can, <laughs> and not knock waters over. Um, and tomorrow, I also will have a hour-long Q&A panel, so there will be more opportunities to ask questions if you have them. Okay, I don't think we have time for questions. Oh, um, but <laughs> sorry, um, due to time restraints. I uh, know, I'm sorry. Um, maybe we can ask you a few questions. So, um, one thing I was curious about um, was how do you get um, a lot of your costumes transported? Uh, you mentioned you need two suitcases. How do you go about that process? Especially for your bigger costumes. Well, it, it is a pain in the butt, I will say. Transport, um, as sometimes you have to make a costume with your suitcase dimension in mind. So I've made wings before that literally had to be measured out to fit into my suitcase exactly. Um, and yeah, you have to every, you have to make concessions for that. Like you're, you may not be able to make the wings as big as you'd like. Um, with Carmilla, it was kind of like, because it was for a contest, it was my dream costume, I was like, I don't care, I'm going all out. I don't care how I have to transport it, I'll figure it out. And so it, it was very much so like, yes, you pay for the extra luggage and you have to figure out how to even, you know, do you have three hands? Can you carry three pieces of luggage around? Um, and uh, sometimes I also try to make costumes that, uh, that are easier to transport with the with the mindset that I can bring them to conventions such as you know in Australia. So the costume I'm wearing right now, actually, which is of the Gunner from Ion, it is a very small costume to pack. It's one jacket and a bodysuit and a wig, um, but it had a lot of details in the costume that. I appealed to me aesthetically and uh, I thought would also be a nice challenge. So I was very happy to find a design like this that would both be, you know, I don't know, would be intricate, but also transportable. Yeah. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about the cosplay you're wearing now? It's lovely. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. That's okay. Sorry, I'm thank putting you, you a bit on the spot there. Um, I will, I, I mean, this one is, I, I have, I don't even know if you guys can see it, but um, it's very warm, and um, I did want to make it to be, um, I wanted to make it to, to, to like, I, I didn't want to make the jacket out of a material that looked girly or something, because the character or, or the class is, it's a warrior class, but I also did not want to make 
a full leather jacket because that would uh, be even warmer. And so I chose a uh, upholstery corduroy-esque material that that I then um, embroidered a lot of leather pieces over. So uh, again, this sort of shows how um, I like to mix different types of materials because I think visually it's very interesting and um, it just creates even more of a depth into your, on your costume. And so a lot of times it's just experimenting, you know, like, you know, I have a lot of fabric accumulated over the years, so I would go shopping in my own little craft room sometimes. Like, if I need something, I just like, you know, go into my craft room and be like, all right, let's see what I maybe, you know, hoarded from eight years ago. And uh, oddly enough, um, I use a lot of things that even if I keep them for like a decade, at some point, they will get used for a costume. So, so <laughs> actually, a lot of my costumes are made that way these days. Just, you know, it's like, hey, if you like been doing it for long enough, <laughs> you will have enough leftovers. <laughs> um, and the bodysuit was actually made with uh, the new pattern that I created with Nicole's patterns. And um, it's really awesome to have, like, to be able to offer a bodysuit pattern that can be customized. And because of the customization, is more comfortable. Than a right, you know, than, than a bodysuit pattern that just has a center front and back seam or just a you know side seam. So um, it, it's like it lasts for longer. I can uh, I mixed uh, a spandex uh, that is matte with a stretch pleather so that it created sort of that you know again like that uh, difference in um, how it photographs and how it catches the light um, and just with like. Just your material choices, I think you can do so much to really elevate your costume to a, a, a new level and um, without that much extra effort, just because of what materials you chose, you can create a costume that is so much more elaborate. So fabric choice and material choice in general is, is very interesting to me and has always been like a favorite part of mine. Cosplay. Was that difficult for you when you first started out with cosplay? Like trying to figure out what would work best? Uh, yes, I once made a costume out of felt because it was the right color and I just did, could not afford um, a better material. It was like, and then afterwards I'm just like, oh god, you know, <laughs> like years after you look at it you're just like, oh, what is this? <laughs> But you gotta do what you gotta do, Are you, you start out somewhere, you, and I think it's just about using what is available to you and being able to budget and, you know, not feeling bad if you can't afford the best materials, you know, um, and just learn more about fabrics because not every cheap fabric is bad or not every expensive fabric is, like, sturdier. Sometimes it's just, you know, the, the, the manufacturing components that, that raise the price, you know, or they're embellished already, so if you choose a uh, simple cot, like simple fabric, <laughs> then it might take you time to embellish it, but you save the money, you know, because you're, like, you're doing the work yourself. So, over the years, I have, um, you know, now, obviously, cosplay being so important to me and part of my livelihood, yes, I will spend a lot of money on fabrics. And uh, time is always more valuable to me than um, money, I yeah. should say. You know, like, time is the utmost value. It's like, it's always about not time managing and um, how to work with these different materials in the most efficient uh, time, yeah. yeah time-saving manner possible. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think we're about ready. Yeah, that's all we have time for, guys. And we'd just like to thank another round of applause for Yaya Han for coming out today. <laughs> Like, come on, I traveled for 20 hours to, to like answer questions. Like, if I know something, if there's anything about cosplay that you experienced and you like, I have trouble with this or I don't understand, you know, why the, this is happening, like, 
talk to me because I've probably been through it. Like when you've been cosplaying for 16 years, you probably I've been through all the stages. <laughs> so you know, I relate to you guys. Please let me assist and help as much as I can. That's what I'm here for. Thank you. <laughs>